Welcome to UWO Now. I'm your host, Wendell Ray. Thanks for joining us for another conversation with a member of our UWO community. It was many decades ago that I remember hearing that in the near future, every household will have a computer in it. Well, it happened. Years later, I heard of a company that sold books online and said it wanted to be like an online mall where you could buy anything there. And it happened. Mobile phones are now smartphones with sophisticated apps and have become integral to our lives. That's technology. It's how it advances. Some new advances, though, have us questioning things, at least some of us. Here to sort through the latest with us is Michael Patton, teaching assistant professor in the Information Systems Department in and the College of Business at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. Michael, thanks so much for coming by and talking to us today on UWO Now. Happy to be here. My pleasure. So, as I was mentioning, uh, there's some things that people are excited about, some things that have some questions about, and hopefully we can kind of address those concerns here today. The first is about AI, and I guess generative AI. Can you define what AI is for us? First of all, so we have a foundation to work with. What is AI and generative AI? Sure. So uh, artificial intelligence, uh, at, le at least in the definition we're using in the college of business, is any time a computer or some other non-human makes decisions in a way a human has made decisions. And, and when I say in a way, I mean in situations. The, the process may not be the same, although you will find that a lot of these artificial intelligences try and mimic our thought process. Okay. But basically, decisions are being made. So for example, it could be a tic-tac-toe game, right? Uh, the, the computer doesn't know where you're going to place the X and the O, but has to respond accordingly with the goal of winning the game. Um, Relatively simple algorithm, only nine possible spots, only two possible entries. The goal is to get three in a row. Uh, the, the algorithm to do that is actually only like seven steps long. And so every decision the computer has to make, it goes through that algorithm. When it finds one of the true things, it, it places that there. Um, where people have been, uh, I think, growing more concerned uh, is, is through the term that you're referencing to as generative AI, which is that the... Uh, that the artificial intelligence isn't just responding to input in a very structured way like a tic-tac-toe game, but is generating new content, whether that be a discussion that we're having in ChatGPT, whether that's a, a picture that's being created in, in Dolly, uh, but, it, but it's generating something new. And, and that is the concern uh, because we're now coming up against something that didn't exist before. So AI has been with us for a long time. A long time. Right. And, and working in the background and we didn't even know it. We just, oh, that, how did they know I'd like Netflix, maybe. Netflix, absolutely. Oh. The, the, you know, what would you like in Netflix? Yeah. That's, that's an artificial intelligence. Or based on what you've watched, exactly. here's another movie you might like. Yes, and, 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 and that's a great example because it's based on what you've watched, right? It's learning from input you have given it as well as input other people have given it. So it's not just saying, you know, you watched the, the Star Wars trilogy and the Lord of the Rings trilogy, so you must be a nerd and here are some things that you want to see. But they're saying, okay, other people who have also watched the Star Wars trilogy and who have also watched the Lord of the Rings trilogy, what other things did they watch and like? That's why it, it wants you to say, I liked this. The other thing is it's that it's doing that's a little more advanced is it, it's paying attention to, did you watch it all the way through or did you stop mm -hmm. five minutes in or did you go back and rewatch a part? And so it's, it's taking all those pieces of input to try and form a profile of you and thus give you something that it thinks you want to hear. And little corrective uh uh, software programs like with Word, mm -hmm. you know, that yep. make suggestions on grammar. And, right. And our, like our, our favorite type ahead when we're texting, yeah. right? It, 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 it tells you what it thinks you're trying to type and, and prompts you for that. And it's, it's amazing how accurate it usually is. So there's AI. Now, I guess there was a lot of um, discussion since a group of these founders or some founders of AI, people who intricately involved in, involved in the development of AI, warned that left unchecked artificial intelligence could pose, quote unquote, an existential threat to human existence. And that got people to getting becoming scared and they start thinking of Terminator right. and all that kind of stuff. Yep. So Very cinematic. Yeah. So <laughs> tell us about 
uh, why we should or should not be concerned. These folks seem to be concerned if left unchecked. Sure, and and, and uh, let's let's be clear at the line that that I believe that they were drawing, which is less the cinematic. Uh, you know, the artificial intelligence is going to create robots that are going to come kill us because we're doing it wrong. So much as it is, it is blurring the line of what we have considered real and what is fiction. You know, one of the things that that we're already seeing in our in our discussion are these chatbots that have gone into Facebook and Twitter and, and all of our social media and and posed as human beings mm-hmm. and have said inflammatory things. And in the past, before we had internet technology and before we had social media, you might know someone who believes some things that that we would consider quote unquote fringe, um, but they didn't have any way of talking to anyone else. And so they had this sense that, well, I'm alone in thinking that. Now that we have social media, uh, social media suggests who you might wanna talk to, groups you might wanna join. It feeds you things in your feed, right? That's what this is called. Uh, And so once again, the goal of the artificial intelligence is trying to show you something that it thinks, doesn't think, that, that, that the program says you want to see more of. And so if if I pick something, uh, you know, I am of political persuasion A and I read an article about per- political persuasion B um, and, I, and I read that all the way through and it offers me some suggestions at the beginning, it might be very balanced. And the, the more choices I make, what we tend to do is really get toward our id, who we really are. Uh, and, and so those those thoughts become more and more extreme. Well, now if I have an artificial, a different artificial intelligence, a chat bot, uh, feeding posts in a, in a propaganda way, I might start seeing those things. And there are no fact checking on this. One, one of the things that I struggle with with this term artificial intelligence, intelligence uh, implies discernment mm-hmm. or judgment or going, no, this seems to be true and this doesn't seem to be true. That is not its job. Uh, even these generative AIs aren't trying to tell us what is true, what is accurate, what is factual, despite all of their their assurances that, well, no, we, we only post factual things. That's not w- what may or may not be programmed in. What they programmed in may have been factual, but as it learns from other input, that may not be. And so there's no emotional. And there's no emotion, attachment. right? There's, there's no, no agenda. No moral. No moral. No moral judgment. Now, like I may I may create an artificial intelligence that I program to input things based on my agenda, but you don't know that it, it's it's clear it's 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 a it's a fiction, um, and and so that's when 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 the founders of artificial intelligence are talking about these existential threats, the discussions I have seen and the people I have talked to, that's what they're talking about is is it's the what we're already seeing is the unraveling of the social fabric. I see a video online that purports to be. Tom Cruise washing dishes. It's it's a relatively famous TikTok, and it looks like Tom Cruise, and it sounds like Tom Cruise, but it's not Tom Cruise. He's he's not talking about this stuff. He, there's another one where he's talking about a meeting he had with the Pope. It's not Tom Cruise. I don't know that the meeting with the Pope ever happened, and mm-hmm. and, and so these things that look feel uh, look and sound real, but more importantly feel real. Well, what's to say it's not real? Other than it didn't really happen. And so once I can no longer separate truth from fiction, now I'm all about emotional persuasive arguments and it can lead people to do um, really dangerous things, as we saw on January 6th of, of uh, the past presidential election. Here. As someone who's involved in studying mm-hmm. this, this, this space, how do you personally feel about where we are with G? Generative AI. Yeah, I, I think generative AI is like any other technology tool. One of the one of the first things that we talk about in our Essentials of IS class, um, uh, Kurzweil was a was a was a famous uh, technologist, and he has a, a great uh, quote that says, um, "Technology is neither good nor bad nor neutral." Well, the first two parts of that phrase are, are easy to parse out, right? We we have a tool in this case technology. How we choose to use it determines whether we get good out of it or bad out of it, right? Mm-hmm. You, you, you take a gun, you're hungry, you, you kill an animal to feed your family, it's good. You have a gun, you take it, you shoot a human because they irritated you, that's bad, right? The gun was irrelevant, it's just a tool. So the technology is neither good nor bad. The part that, that I think really trips people up and that we don't talk about enough is it's not neutral either. 
if I have the exact same number of people who get good out of a technology and the exact same number of people who use that technology for bad, the world has changed. Neither one of those outcomes happened before the technology. So the technology is not neutral. The technology changes the world. And once a technology is introduced, whether we like it or not, we need to deal with it. That's one of the things I find frustrating about this. Well, we need to put a pause on AI. I can guarantee you that the people who want to do us harm are not pausing because they recognize the power of the tool. So the, the concern about pausing artificial intelligence is like worrying about locking the barn door after the cows have gone and run away. Yeah. It's done. How are we going to deal with it now? Uh, and, and we should still be having those ethical discussions and we should, we should still be talking in frank and real terms about the power of the tool. But the tool exists. What are you going to do with it? You're listening to UWO Now. I'm Wendell Ray, and we're talking with Michael Patton, teaching assistant professor in the Information Systems Department at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh College of Business. You just mentioned something uh, that I want to kind of ask. We talked at the beginning that AI has been around, Mm -hmm. just kind of working and doing what it does. How do we know how far we're into generative AI? I mean, has it been, maybe we're just knowing about it, but it could have been around and doing the things you're talking about for years. So, so generative AI is relatively new, although it's, it's on a progression that we have seen, right? We, we started with artificial intelligence that was very algorithmic, right? I'm, I know I have a definitive set of inputs and there's going to be a definitive possible number of outcomes. Think of that as the tic-tac-toe game, right? Very limited scope. Um, the dream of technologists has always been, I want to create an artificial intelligence that, that is indistinguishable from a human. In fact, you may have, you may have heard of the Turing test. Uh, Alan Turing was a British mathematician during World War II, uh, but was thinking about these, the power of these new computing things. Uh, and, and he suggested a test that if you had um, two quote-unquote interviewees, that were blind, right? You had a person come in and was asking questions via a keyboard or some other way of of these two different interviewees. And one was a human and one was an artificial intelligence. And the person couldn't tell the difference based on the questions they asked, right? You you would want to try and trip up the technology Mm -hmm. to ask it something only a human would know. Um, If the computer and the human were indistinguishable in that blind test, we had achieved true artificial intelligence. Uh, I, I think we've moved beyond that as a concept, and uh, but but that's kind of roughly where the, where the history comes. That was World War II. Okay. Now the computers weren't that far yet, yeah. um, uh, but but this has been coming slowly along a path. Uh, one of the things that I've that I've asked my students is uh, we we show them a video at the beginning of class, and this video is like seven years old. It was at a Google conference where the artificial intelligence that is now in every one of your uh, and or Google phones. Um, made a haircut appointment for this person. And so the person at the other end of the phone call was an actual hair salon. And they say, you know, I need to make a, a women's haircut appointment between noon and two on Tuesday. And the woman's like, well, we, we don't have anything at two. Uh, you know, what what time? And and so the, the artificial intelligence goes, well, I'm, I'm looking for between noon and two. Well, what about, they say, well, it depends on what do they want to do? Just a simple haircut. Okay, well, that's at 1230, right? There's this exchange. Mm-hmm. So when we're done showing the video, because we see it from the outsider perspective, right? We know it's an artificial intelligence. I say to my students, do you think the lady at the hair salon knew it was an artificial intelligence she was talking to? And they said, no. I said, okay. Let's say you've done telemedicine with your doctor and you turn on your computer and you've got your camera on and it's showing you and you're talking to this thing at the other end. How do you know that's a doctor? Right. How do you know that's not some animation with an artificial intelligence sitting behind it? And, and so when I, when I ask my students, you know, like, would you ever ride in an autonomous vehicle? They say, no. I said, do you use cruise control? Well, yeah, I use cruise control. Do you have the adaptive cruise control that the closer you get to the car in front of you, it slows down? Well, yeah, that's artificial intelligence. It's limited, but but we're working toward a world where these things are be going to become less and less obvious. And so one of the ethical questions we may want to discuss is, 
do you have an obligation to tell people it's an artificial intelligence? And if you do that, now we bring in the prejudices that people have about intelligence. Well, intelligence is going to break down and work. Yeah, because we know humans are perfect. <laughs> humans never make mistakes. Uh, and, and what we see, for example, with autonomous vehicles, even the technology we have with autonomous vehicles today is safer than human driving. And, and that technology we have already deemed isn't ready for consumption, but it's still better than us. So imagine how good it's going to be once it is out there available to us. I, my son went to Arizona State and graduated this last spring, and we were down there, and one of the, the technologies that we talk about in our class is a company called Waymo. Uh, it's autonomous, essentially, taxis. And so we were, we were back at our, at our apartment, and I see a Waymo sitting there. I thought, oh, I forgot they're in Phoenix. I'm going to take one. So we did. We, we took the rental car to the hotel, dropped it off, and we took the Waymo back. It drove better or as good as any Uber driver I've been in. We just sat in the back. We watched it do its thing. Uh, and if you, if you come take essentials of IS from us, we'll show you that video uh, that I took in the back seat as this artificial intelligence drove me from the airport to the rental house we were staying in. And it was just a rental house, right? It wasn't like it took me to a place. It, was, it wasn't a fixed route. It had to figure out how to go. It had to deal with the other cars on the road. And the question that people always ask, well, did, did you feel safe? I said, I felt as safe as anything else because I understand and I know somewhat what is going on behind the scenes. Now, it helped. It had a display. I could see what it was, quote unquote, seeing as a pedestrian walked by on the side of the road. I saw a little dot moving by on the side of the road. So you, you can if you take just a second to get a basic understanding of this, a lot of these fears that we have about technology fall by the wayside, not because some of the dangers aren't real. They're absolutely real. But as with anything that is potentially dangerous, like driving, like owning a gun, like reading, if you understand what the dangers are, you can deal with them. And far too often we, we, we take refuge in our ignorance. Oh, I'm not a technology person. Oh, that's too complicated for me. I'm not asking you to design it. I'm asking you to understand it enough to use it. In the same way I ask you to understand the basics of driving to drive a car. I'm Wendell Ray, and we're talking with Michael Patton, teaching assistant professor in the Information Systems Department at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh's College of Business. Um, when we were talking about AI, uh, you mentioned the Tom Hanks video. Tom Cruise. Uh, yeah. Tom Cruise. I'm Tom sorry. Cruise. Yep. Tom Cruise videos. Yep. Excuse me. Um, and I guess that whole uh, area where you have the ability to make it appear that someone is doing something has people afraid is been was the impetus for the strike in Hollywood with writers and so forth who are wondering about copyright and uh, actors wondering about the use of their image. How do we get around that? How do we regulate that? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I don't I don't know that regulation in the in the sense that there is a, a law passed or, or whatever is done. Uh, we, we need to have a discussion and there is an ethical issue. Um, for example, uh, if if Tom Cruise lost an acting job because of whatever this person could do on TikTok, uh, that would be problematic, potentially, um, because one goes to a Tom Cruise movie to see Tom Cruise, <laughs> yes. right? Um, and, and so if you're being told that it's Tom Cruise and Tom Cruise is not reaping the benefits of it, that's problematic, right? That's, a, that's an ethical problem that, that we need to address. However, uh, I... You know, I'm a, a child of the 70s and 80s, loved the Star Wars movies, grew up on them. And, you know, unfortunately, um, Princess Leia, Carrie Fisher, died before the completion of that last movie. And yet, because of the artificial intelligence, because of the generative AI, she could be in that last movie with the blessing of her estate. Uh, and and it, it felt mostly real. You know, if you look at it closely enough, you can tell it's not really a person, but dang, it's close. And we're getting closer all the time. James Earl Jones uh, has mm -hmm. uh, some sort of legal agreement with CNN that they can have. This is CNN for the for eternity. Right. Okay. Um, so so those things are happening ethically. The reason for the strike and the reason for the concern and the reason uh, my, my daughter and I, who, who works at uh, art museums at, at Iowa State University, um, go round and round is, well, what do I do when it's not necessarily uh, with given permission? Uh, you know, for example, you, you talked about the, the current actors strike. Um, 
there have been instances today when actors have gone to work for a commercial on a movie or whatever. And part of the thing that they're having to sign is uh, we get to retain your images and may use them as part of artificial intelligence. Well, there is a large number of actors who are never stars, who make their money off of small commercials, et cetera, or crowd work. Yeah. Right? They pay the actors who are walking behind the actors that you're paying attention to. Extras. Now we can throw that in with a green screen. They they don't necessarily get paid for it because I have the di digital image and I can make them run and I can make them do whatever. Um, that becomes problematic if you are not a willing party at the beginning of that agreement. If it's if it's thrown in in the in the small print. If it's we'll do this or we're not hiring you. You know, that's a little coercive. We need to talk about the ethics behind that. And, you know, Hollywood has historically not been the most ethical place in doing business. Uh, and, and so these are, I think, legitimate concerns people have. Um, I was talking with a friend of mine a couple of weeks ago at an AI conference, and she showed me this headshot that she got done for her resume. Well, what she did was she took 20 selfies, took, gave it to this AI website, and got 100 different looking headshots. And she could say, I want this a professional look. I want books in the background. I want to be wearing this kind of outfit. I want this kind of hairstyle, all based on her selfies combined with other people's selfies. Now, that's legitimate. She submitted the selfies. She got something back. The picture itself never happened. She was never wearing that outfit. Her hairstyle mm -hmm. was never done that way. And yet, if you needed something done real quick, something that looked professional and sharp, really great way to do it. Where that brings in questions and and you know uh, may lead into a question you and I've talked about in the future is well all of those pictures could be saved by an AI company when you agreed to get these headshots done did you sign over your rights to those images can they use that to teach their artificial intelligence now we get into things like uh, state surveillance um, and one of the things that's important to remember about technology is while the technology itself is dispassionate, dispassionate, emotionless, and not prejudiced. It reflects the input we give it. Um, Microsoft created an artificial intelligence that it was going to use for HR companies, right? You, you want to take out the unconscious bias people have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I was talking to someone the other day and they were talking about, I don't remember what the profession was, but the picture in my mind immediately was a man. Well, it was a woman. Okay. It's not that I don't think women can't do that job. It's just I have an unconscious bias that I assumed it was a man. So you want to take that out of HR hiring. Right? I want the best person for the job. Gender, sex, race, none of that should matter, right? Give me the best person for the job. Well, if all I ever teach this artificial intelligence about is past experience, and the past experience has had the unconscious bias, the new experience has the unconscious bias. Um and, and so this, this artificial intelligence Microsoft created, they had to shut it down after a day because it had become racist. Because the people interacting with it uh, were saying ra more and more racist things. And it said, well, this, is, this must be how we interact. And it, be, okay. it, it got this weird thing. And so they shut it down, reprogrammed it to, to you know, change. Okay, these kinds of phrases are not acceptable and blah, 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 blah. And, and so they do learn and they get better, but it's all based on the input we give it. And if we give it bad input, just as if you, you know, teach your kids that uh, dragonflies have stingers and can get you, that's what the long tail is. Well, that's what they'll believe because that's what they were taught. What about this issue with TikTok and it being banned on federal devices and many state devices? Mm -hmm. um, what is the issue with TikTok that some governments are, and the federal government, uh, is is so anxious about? Sure, and it, and it's banned here for state employees in the state of Wisconsin as well. So so if the university provided me with a cell phone, I could not put TikTok on that cell phone and, and use it. And the reason being is a lot of these technologies in the in the guise of being a better service, and and that part is also true, collect a lot of information from us that we're not aware of. For example, even if you turn off GPS locations, as you move around, your phone is still collecting all the GPS locations. If you, if you turn off um, the microphone on your, um, on your Alexa at home, well, how do you turn it back on? You say, Alexa, turn on. So the microphone is still on, right? Um, these things are always listening and always watching and always paying attention to that stuff. And so 
different companies want to keep track of that information to offer better services. One of the things that Facebook offers is you can pin yourself. So you you go to I was I was just at the uh, Iowa football game this weekend and, and we went with some friends. So how do you meet up with your friends? Well, you drop a pin and say, I'm here at Mickey's. And even if you don't know where Mickey's is and whatever, I can use the GPS and almost walk up to your table. Um, well, that's great if that's something I'm choosing to do. But because all of this is being stored and kept and tracked, um, now we deal with foreign companies and, and frankly, even private companies that are keeping track of all of this. And, and, and now people have information about us we may not want them to have. For example, I want to um, assassinate a, a political figure. Well, if, if, the, if the political figure's assistant has some software on it that is tracking where he or she is going and doing things, I can now, with some logical... Uh, and reasonable uh, estimation, figure out where the political figure is going to be mm -hmm. uh, and, and make the appropriate things. And, and so the, the specific concern about TikTok is uh, TikTok is owned by a company called ByteDance. ByteDance is a company based in China. Um, the, the rules and the laws in China say that the Chinese state has the ability to access data uh, from anyone, anywhere, anytime, essentially. And so because ByteDance is a Chinese company, they would be subject to those laws. Now, they have tried to offset this by saying, well, we keep all the American data in America. Um, you know, we never we never store it here. We would definitely turn down that request by the Chinese government to see American data. Um, I don't know what I would do if the state came to my door with, you know, weapons, with threats of whatever. Um, and let's be real. These are internet enabled systems uh, just because the data is quote unquote stored in the united states uh, if you have a friend in china and you're exchanging information right that that data has to be exchanged in some way shape or form uh, so so these ideas that you can segregate this stuff is um overly simplistic mm -hmm. and and not realistic can can we put in measures to make it less likely absolutely but that that's the primary concern What's been your path to UWO? How'd you get here? And, and tell us how you uh, became an instructor. Sure. Well, um, I, I grew up in Iowa, went to the University of Iowa to college uh, where I met my wife. Uh, and I was originally going to be a high school social studies teacher. My, my undergraduate degree was in political science uh, with minors in history and French. So I've naturally spent my entire career in information systems. Uh, when we moved here to Wisconsin, um, UW Oshkosh is a great teaching school, uh, and so there weren't a whole lot of teaching jobs available for someone with a degree from Iowa, and I didn't want to substitute teach forever. So my wife's assistant's boyfriend uh, was working for a systems integrator uh, that had offices in Milwaukee and Appleton back in 1994, <laughs> and uh, he, yeah. he said, uh, well, you, you, you have a, a teaching background. Um, I ran a computer lab in college, so I knew something about technology. And, and these were back in the days we were literally pe teaching people how to double click. Um, so I, I started as a, as a basic computer instructor, teaching people some really basic skills. What is Word? What is Excel? Mm -hmm. How do you write a formula? Um, really, really relatively simple things. Um, and, and I can tell this story in a half hour version, but we don't have that kind of time. So I'll just say... Um, by raising my hand and saying yes when opportunities were offered, I was able to expand my knowledge. At a, at a certain point in my career, I stopped teaching about it and, and actually went and practiced the stuff and, and worked in private industry for another year. So I worked for a door company. I worked for a promotional products company. I worked for a systems integrator. I worked for companies that uh, tried to reduce energy costs um, through, through various technologies. I got my both my master's and my master's uh, my MBA and my master's in science and information systems here at UW Oshkosh, uh, and after all of that stuff, real world experience, uh, getting my degrees here, um, whatever reason, somebody here thought I might be a decent teacher, okay. uh, and so I had a colleague who reached out and said, "Hey, we're looking for someone to teach one section of Essentials of IS. Are you interested?" Uh, the first time they asked, I was in the middle of some job stuff, couldn't do it, uh, but they came back and asked again, and so I did. I taught a, uh, a, a section of Essentials of IS, ironically, uh, with the uh, associate dean of the college's son in the class. There's no pressure there. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, but, but that seemed to go okay. I, I was an adjunct for a couple years, uh, and then they said, hey, we, we got a full-time position open doing this. 
Uh, and, and so I had to think long and hard about that because, you know, working for State University, raking in the bucks, yeah, right. uh, had, to t- had to take a fairly significant pay cut, uh, but haven't looked back, love doing it, love, love working with the students because the students here at UW Oshkosh are world class. You know yeah. that. Um, they they can match with anyone, and and those that are really curious and ask great questions. Oh, there's nothing better. Okay, so tell me what is quantum computing? I guess that's something I've been hearing about recently. Very sophisticated uh, form of computing. How is it different from what we have in our homes or in our phones right now? Sure. So so computers from their conceptual implementation, you know, in Victorian ages. Uh, all the way up through now, has been based on what we call a binary system, right? You have two choices, yes or no, on or off. Um, and, and so we in computing, we call that a bit, right? Uh, if you want to think about it as a coin, it's heads or tails. Binary digits. Right, binary digits, right? So two options, one or zero, yes or no, uh, on or off, et cetera, et cetera. And so anything you do on the computer today is a sequence of questions that say yes or no, on or off, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, it may for something as complex as generating a picture in Dali, that takes a lot of computing cycles. There's a lot of yes or no questions. Of, where is the hand? What is a hand? Right? All, all of those yes or no questions that have to be answered to get you to whatever you're seeing. Uh, and so as a result, uh, computing has gotten uh, more complicated. The processors can do more of those yes or no calculations. Uh, every microsecond, um, we can we can hang on to some of that data in RAM, which is temporary, or on a hard drive, which is permanent. Um, and but but it's all based on this yes or no, ones or zeros type thing, or to use the coin analogy, heads or tails. How we make it better, faster, is we basically try and get more of those brains, those those processors that do yes or no, into a single space because I want to carry it in my phone or I want it to be well. The laws, of, because all this is done with electricity, the laws of physics are such we are getting close to the point where an electron running on one of these um, circuits on your circuit board is so close to the other one that it may jump over onto the other one. And, and, and now the calculation of my yes or no gets confused. We're, we're running close to the physical limits of the materials and the technology we have to stay with these yes and no ideas. So some quantum physicist, and and we we are about to reach the level of my understanding, um, some quantum physicist has decided that, well, there are these forces in the in the universe that are not binary, that 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 supersede what we know or can prove about our physical space, and yet we know they exist because we can see their evidence. And so quantum computing says, rather than flipping a coin and waiting till it lands to see if it's heads or tails, quantum computing uses what we call a qubit rather than a bit, right? A bit is a one or a zero. In a qubit, you can have a one, you can have a two, you can have a zero, you can have a one zero, you can have a zero one. So it it is calculating maybe not all the possibilities, but a far significantly larger array of possibilities at the same time and in the same way that it would just say yes or no. Uh, if, if, if I was going to guess your address uh, and, and, I was, and it was under the premise that you were going to play along nicely, mm-hmm. I would go, well, is your house number one? And you'd be like, no, nobody lives at one anything. Was yeah. well, your house number two? Right. And I would keep guessing yes or no until I got the house number. Then I'd start naming streets, right? And eventually I would get to your address. Um, a, a, a qubit could essentially ask a more open-ended question. Does your house number have just digits? Yes. Is your house number three digits? Yes or no, right? So, so it, 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 it encompasses multiple possibilities at once. As a result, one of the things that they tell you about what's a good password, it used to be, well, it had to be a letter and a number and a special character and blah, blah, blah. With our current computing technology, the key to a password is length. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to brute force attack via a password, it's basically going to do what I just did. Is your password A? No, is it capital A? No, is it it one, right? I'm just going to keep guessing until I come up with your password. And once you get a password longer than 12 characters, uh, basically, the computing power we have right now 
without blind luck would not guess your password in a lifetime. So now the, the key to a long password is length. Well, with quantum computing, and once again, this is an analogy, this isn't exactly how it works, but it could guess entire words at once or entire phrases at mm -hmm. once. And so it's going to come up with a, a password that used to take current computing a lifetime to do. It's going to be able to pick it up in seconds because it's going through more possibilities at once uh, than is capable with current technology. The challenge with quantum computing is because it's dealing with quantum physics and, and all the things with that, it generates a ridiculous amount of heat and uses a ridiculous amount of energy. So... A decade ago, quantum computers didn't even exist. They do exist now, uh, but are used in very limited situations, primarily by military uh, state actors to calculate, you know, probabilities of war scenarios, blah, 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 blah. Um, but they burn themselves up. They, they have to keep getting reinvented because of the, the amount of heat that they generate. Yeah, they have to be cool. That oh, and, and cool way rates. beyond air conditioning you think of, right? <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, air conditioning for this building could not cool a quantum computer. Yeah. Um, and, and so at the moment, with the technology we have, with the materials we're using, that quantum computing is, is a very limited scope. But a decade ago, it didn't exist. Now we have functional quantum computers. And, and I remember uh, it, was, it was actually a company in Canada publicly got the first quantum computer to work. It did a handful of calculations and burned itself out in a, in a matter of seconds. Mm. Well, now we have ones that, that operate, right? Okay. Um, and so just as with the technology we saw that took us from you know computers that took up whole rooms when I was a kid, uh, now to more powerful computers than that we carry around in our pockets that we call phones, but they're really computers. Right. That's going to happen with quantum computing and, and it will be an exponential change, right? It will go from nobody has them to everybody has them relatively shortly in, in a sh relatively short period of time. I don't mean shortly from now. I mean, when the change yeah. happens, it'll be fairly quick. Um, I don't foresee that happening soon, but I, I may not be the best futurist, so I may be way off. And maybe, it, maybe it's tomorrow. And you know, all of a sudden, uh, IBM is going to announce we, we've cracked quantum computing and solved the heating and cooling and size problem. And, and now we're going to you know, sell them for a few thousand dollars rather than hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. Uh, and and that, that, that exponential change, that's, that's one of the things that I think is challenging about our current world. And, and I really try and get our, our students to think about it. Change throughout history, basically up until the year 2000, was relatively linear. You know, there, were, there was concern when the tractor came out. Oh, my gosh, you know, 60, 70 percent of our people are farmers. The tractor's going to come and take all those jobs away. The world's going to go to heck in a handbasket. Well, yes and no. Did all those people leave the farms? Absolutely. If you take a look at how many people are farmers right now, it is a relatively small amount of the population. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're creating so much more food in so much less land with that smaller base, right? That technology did what it was supposed to. But what happened? Well, the technology of, of working the land really wasn't all that much different than, than what you needed to know to go to a factory and screw a bolt on a car, right? And, and so... That change happened slowly enough that we could adapt. Um, what we started seeing in around the year 2000 with various technologies, whether it's artificial intelligence or robotics or smartphones, is these changes are happening at an exponential rate, right? We, I remember, uh, and my apologies to my IS311 students who may be hearing this because you've heard this story before and probably are going to hear it a million times again. When I was a, a senior in college, um, you could sign up to get this thing called an email account right. and it was text only. Mm -hmm. And I, and I had a friend in Germany and I found out his email address cause he was in school at the same time I was. And so I, I typed in this, this message and, and sent it and he got it immediately and then immediately responded. I'm like, Holy nuggets. This, this is awesome. <laughs> this is the future. This is the future, man. And I went, I went to my dad who was, who was running a business. I said, dad, you got to get this email thing. I, I can send this big, long letter. I don't have to get a stamp. I don't have to go to a post office. This is awesome. He said, okay, who am I going to email? I said, me. <laughs> he said, who else? I, said, I don't know. He said, how do I get this thing? I'm like, I don't know. Right. Cause this was 1994. Right. Right. 
And, uh, you know, that was, that was mid to late 90s. And by 2000, tons of people had email and they had this internet and the World Wide Web, right? That, that was also a brand new thing. Um, and, and, you know, in a matter of a, a few years, we went from this thing that nobody had to now you can't live without it. I asked my mm-hmm. students, you know, it's like, what would you do if Google wasn't available? Right. Why, YouTube? Well, no, no. What if the internet was not there? Right. That, that's my lifetime. Yeah. That's my gener- That's a generation. That's between me and my kids. Uh, as I said, my son went to Arizona State and he was, you know, getting a little nervous about being that far from home. I'm like, Tegan, I grew up in Rockwell City, Iowa. I went to the University of Iowa. It was about a four hour drive from my house to my university. The phone was on the wall. You had to schedule the call back at home to make sure someone was at home because if they weren't there or you weren't there, no one, no phone call happened. Right? right. And I only got to see them when I went home for the holidays. You are flying halfway across the continent to go to Arizona State in the greater Phoenix area. You have this thing you carry in your pocket that has a camera and a microphone on it. We can talk face to face 24 7, 365. And God forbid something happens, go up to the Appleton Airport, get on a plane. I'm going to be where you are in approximately four hours. You are as close to me halfway across the country 30 years after I went to school than I was to my parents in the same state. These exponential changes we as humans are not designed for. We Evolutionarily, we are designed for linear changes, right? The lion's running at us on the savanna. That's a danger. We recognize the danger. Climb the tree or whatever, right? Um, what do you do when you get a phishing email? How do I even know it's a phishing email, right? The, these are changes that biologically we are not ready for, and so we underestimate the risk. Uh, which is why the the conference on AI, right? We we don't know what's going to happen because the changes are happening so fast. We're not adapting for it, um, and also not just happening like in one particular er- area, but it's going to it, it shrinks the world. Yeah, it could it could have applications in many parts of your life. Absolutely, in various industries, if not all industries. M- most of our students today, by the time they retire, will be retiring from jobs that don't exist today. Right, that we can't even contemplate, mm-hmm. you know, that, that I would be, had you told college age me that, oh, your job 30 years from now is going to be talking about artificial intelligence that you kind of understand <laughs> um, to, you know, and, and that, that does so much stuff in your life. You know, I, I remember I, I happened to be in school in 1984, uh, high school, but in school. And so I read the book, 1984, and it talks about these, these walls that had screens and cameras and you could interact with them. Hey, we got that. <laughs> and it wasn't in 1984, yeah. but right. we're not that far off. Yeah. Right. So all of this stuff that was very sci-fi when 1984 was written is real. The, the, the flip phone you and I had uh, in our younger days from Motorola was inspired by something that was on Star, Star Trek. Trek. Yeah. Um, so, so, so all of this stuff that we think is science fiction-y, these autonomous vehicles that I say to my students, you know, would you ever ride in one? Well, I have, and it, it's, it's available to the public. Um, you know, the, the, the world is changing fast. Now we can have, we have two choices. We can throw up our hands and go, oh my gosh, it's too fast. I can't deal with it. Well, technology is neither good nor bad nor neutral. Technology is here. It's going to deal with you if you don't deal with it. And you don't have to become a technologist and you don't have to understand everything. You just heard my horrible uh, description of quantum computing. But I know enough about it to go, okay, this is roughly how it works. Mm -hmm. Same way most of us don't know how to tear our car apart and put it back together. But we know roughly how it works so we can use it. We need to get to that point with all of these new technologies. Because the world's going to move on and we can either be run over by it or we can hitch a ride, and, and I'm going to choose to hitch the ride because I think it's going to be a heck of a ride. Michael Patton, thanks so much for coming by and talking to us today on UWL Now, helping to us, helping us sort through some of this new technology, what it means for our lives. Thanks again for coming by. Thanks, Wendell. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for listening to UWO Now. Remember to catch the latest episode of UWO Now. Go to our website. You can go to wrst.org, or you can watch us on the UWO YouTube page. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>